Pan Pan Psychast. Part three, sad love. So in our previous installment, we spoke about how our ideas of love and what we experience to be love is shaped by one of, if not two, different forces. The biology behind what gives rise to these loving experiences and why we begin to love in the first place, one might think. The reason why we love says those who think that love is grounded in biology is for the purposes of reproduction, for the purposes of continuing the species. And that's why you fall head over heels for that special somebody. And then we've got the social constructivists who say that our ideas of love are shaped by what society teaches us, by what we see in the newspaper stands, Mm. on the front page of Cosmo, listening to music on the radio and watching rom-coms at the cinema. And that's where we get our ideas of love from. Now, in this installment, we're not just going to be talking about what love is, but we're going to be moving from the descriptive of what it is to the ought, what love could or should be. But before we do that, we just want to give Carrie Jenkins' ultimate view in what love is, which is a bridging of these two views, the biological and the social. And she says, love is ancient biological machinery embodying a modern social role. Could we say, what does that mean exactly? Yeah, so she proposes how love's dual nature fits together with the analogy of an actor playing a role. So she says, quote, some of our ancient evolved biological machinery, a collection of neural pathways and chemical responses, is currently playing the starring role of a romantic love in a show called Modern Society. So in this show, we can see things about the character, how it structures society, how we create love in the process. And this can be studied by the humanities and the social sciences, and it's localized in a time and in a place. And we can also see things about the actor. So that's how the dopamine is involved, for example. Mm. And this is something that we can learn about through science, and it's consistent across time and space with a bit of interpersonal variation. So the answer to what romantic love is, is dual an ancient biological machinery embodying a modern social role. In other words, when we watch William Shatner playing Captain Kirk, is that we are aware at the same time that, yes, we see Shatner as the actor, but he is playing the part of Kirk. And assuming that he's playing it well, that we are buy into that. And so Mm -hmm. there is no contradiction in terms here is what she is saying. I think this sounded, when I was reading it, almost on face value, quite appealing as a way of putting it. We can understand that it does not reject the biological stuff, that that's important, that it is there. But there is quite a lot of flexibility. The script, as it were, that is given to us by society might vary. And we learn how to play that role and we play it to the best of our abilities. Of course, not everybody will be successful in the script that they are given, but that's not the point right now. The fact is, is that it is being given. And I just want to raise one other point here as well, is that there is a sense that in some way, and I'm not sure if Kerry Jenkins puts this this way herself, but there's a sense that the actor almost dictates at least in some degree what the script can be, like, as mm-hmm. in like what the limits of the script could possibly yeah. be. So there is something about the biology that means there is only a, so many different varieties of script that we could get that the biological actor would be willing to play. As in, I think it would be, who knows if it's impossible, but it would be quite hard to convince the society that the romantic relationships that they should have would be pursuing with, say, animals. Like, could you convince a group of people that that was the script that they were going to play? Probably not. I know that seems almost stupid to even bring up, but I'm just saying that there are clearly limits to what you might be able to encourage human beings to do purely Mm. based on cultural influence. She gives a couple of examples of both these ideas. Just to quote what she thinks that script is then, she says, the script is an off-the-peg deal, as in the script that we're all given before we freely choose to do something otherwise. She says, it's sex, passion, affection, care, commitment, settling down, marriage, earning less or more than your spouse, doing more or less the housework, having kids, getting bored with sex, monogamy forever, then death. She does paint a, quite a picture of that as the book goes on, perhaps not intentionally, but every now and then she does have a little sigh at the fact that this is a view, right? That monogamy isn't this perfect picture that so many people consider it to be. 
Yeah, and she gives quite a nice metaphor to show how love is socially constructed in that way. So she gives us the idea of uh, thousands of images and individual representations overlaid. And from that, patterns and contours emerges. So we need to look at what sort of emerges from that and what emerges from this composite image of romantic love is what Mm. Jack has just said, this idea of monogamy and happily ever after and all of that. And that formation is sort of privileged within our society. So it will make it easier for individuals to access social and legal benefits and marriage has less social stigma than not. And it's the one that's the most represented in art and culture and social life as well. Yeah. And so to sum that up, then one of the other things she comes back to a couple of times in the book is she says, love is what love does. And she says that what love currently does in societies like the UK or Canada or the US is where she also references almost the script is designed to encourage monogamous, Mm. pair bonding, Mm. children, institutional marriage. What Jack has already said that, that almost flippant, like you'll do this, you'll play out, everybody knows how it goes and then we die. Mm. That's the current model. Now that's not to say that everybody is happy with that. And maybe people play these scripts and might be quite dissatisfied. But the point is, is that the scripts are so powerful that it pushes people to do it even when it doesn't really suit them to do so. It's essentially the bad faith existentialist idea, isn't it? That you just fall into your life and you don't think about it for yourself. And then you'll end up just fulfilling the script without even thinking about it. Yeah. And I think what she's doing by emphasizing the social aspect is showing that we are collectively creating it and sustaining it. Mm. And so forming these contours of our idea of romantic love. And I think that also gives people responsibility to know that we can change it as well. And I think that's something Mm -hmm. she puts emphasis on that there are aspects that we need to think about changing and we can do it. So we each have a responsibility to do it. Which brings us on to, I think, the important point now, which is we've hovered around a couple of these things that she might describe as being problematic or stifling or limiting. What is it that the script provides society, which maybe not everybody, but a lot of people might find dissatisfying? And she provides loads, but you can probably come up with a whole bunch of things yourself about here's something that I wouldn't personally have gone down that route Mm. and yet here I am kind of thing. Preface this with one point and she makes this point as well. If you happen to actually be living the life of the script that has been given to society, that can be absolutely fine as long as you have thought about it, chosen it and have committed to that path because you personally do see that it is for you. That's great if that's the case. So if you are in a monogamous relationship, happily married with children, living all of that stuff that we're going to be talking about, that is great, but it's just Mm. not for everybody. Mm. And that's the point. So should we start by identifying some of these things that she says are potentially problems for people who don't want to follow the script? Society, Jenkins tells us, tells us that we should aspire to a life that's full of love and happiness, that the best things in life are free, that we should pursue love and happiness, and that romantic love is the most important kind of love, and that love should be between two individuals. Now, she takes issue with all of those throughout the book, and there are lots of subsections to each of them, so I don't really know where to, where to start with them. Well, let me give you a hand with that, Jack. So let's start off with kind of some of the language that Carrie Jenkins uses. So we're going to go with this word. Sorry if it's a bit of a mouthful. So we've got monogamous amatonormativity. And this word means, comes from the Latin ama, or to love, and norma, which means a standard against which things are measured, coined originally by Elizabeth Brake, which is just the widespread assumption that everyone is better off in exclusive romantic long-term relationships, and that that is the cultural norm that is expected from people. To quote directly from a book, in a society that values romantic love as its primary model for a normal life, Powerful feelings of care and desire that one experiences for another person will tend to be focused towards the creation of a marriage based on monogamous, lifelong, reproductive family unit with one person. And that is the goal. And if you do not reach that goal, you are failing. And this is something that she's arguing very prevalent in the UK, Canadian, American, Western culture, that if you do not reach this goal, it is seen as something which is necessarily not like you failed life. But I would say it is seen to have a lot of cultural capital. Mm. That if you are fulfilling this role, this is how society, quote unquote, should be running. She criticizes also the idea, right, that it's either Romeo and Juliet tragedy or the success of the fairy tale ending. But some people do see that failure of a romantic relationship to be the failure of their very purpose of being. Mm. They put all of their value into having that successful relationship. 
which raises lots of questions about the meaning, value of life, the purpose of relationships, etc. Yeah, in some imagine normativity says that romantic love is the normal or ideal condition for human life. So lives that don't right. include it are imperfect or abnormal. So whether it's both of the two examples you've just described there, her general starting point here is actually just to say, whatever we talk about love, if mm. we make society so focused on this, is that we actually miss out that one, love is not necessarily for everybody, at least a specific type of love. And that by creating a standard in which to meet, you are inevitably going to have a lot of people that don't meet that standard. Mm. She references, we talked about the platonic dialogue of the symposium, the myth of Aristophanes talking about the two people trying to find themselves whole. And then she mentions that Simon Rich wrote a short story that was called The Children of the Dirt that plays off this. And he uses the same myth and then adds another bit and says that it wasn't just the children of the earth and the children of the moon, these two pairs trying to find each other, but there were also children of the dirt who never had anybody to find. The point being here is, is that there are a large amount of people that, for many reasons, never mm. find a romantic partner. And if you're living in a, a society that is focused on this amount of normativity, is that lots of people just feel like they're a failure by default. We might get a bit of pushback and saying, well, does society really have this amateur normativity? But it really does. Like if you marry someone, like you have more legal rights, especially if something happens to your partner. And, you know, she mentions in her book that there comes a legal and financial incentive to stay together, mm. which often makes alternatives costly and complicated. So if you don't want to follow this social script of monogamy, you can choose to, but your life is going to be harder because of it. Whether it's if you're polyamorous or even if you just stay single. I mean, it's silly, isn't it? Like the stereotype of a single person, I think is really interesting culture. I don't know if people remember the movie Bridget Jones's Diary, but there's obviously <laughs> a very famous rom-com about a lady who, like now, obviously it was made in the 90s, early 2000s. It was seen as like, oh, this poor lady, you know, she owns her own place. She's a rich, successful, lives in London, but she can't find a man. And therefore her life is a misery. There's been like a proper interesting cultural dialogue with that movie today because people are like, she has every, she lives in zone one. Like she can afford to live in central London on her own. And she has an amazing job and really close friends. Like, how is that someone to be sympathetic with? Mm. Like she's on top, right? She's got everything. But that's just how pervasive those social scripts are. I mean, especially if you look at rom-coms as a genre, I think they really play on that sort of thing of those kind of really interesting monogamous amateur normativity stereotypes. Let us pause for a moment to say a quick thank you to all our lovey-dovey patrons for making the show possible. In particular, a very special thank you to He Sees Love Like Asthma. It takes his breath away. It's Jamie Lung. They steal hearts like children. It's Leslie Robson Foster. People try to tell him love is blind, but clearly they have never seen his mountains of money. It's Joe Richardson. They see love like a young tennis player. It literally means nothing to them. It's Carter Young. The Beatles once said all you need is love. He thinks they've missed foie gras, caviar and Dom Perignon. It's Dan Posh. If you're enjoying the show and you want to reach existential freedom, then please head over to patreon.com forward slash pansidecast to show your support. A link is also in the iTunes description. Right, let's jump back into it. Yeah, and I think that just really emphasizes the idea that anyone who's deviating from this script is sort of inadequate and doesn't fit into it. And we really need to think about what we should be adding to the, our composite image of love to make it more inclusive and more respectful of different people's choices. And another aspect which is often excluded is the idea of polyamory. So Carrie Jenkins speaks a lot about this in the book and about the stigma that she's had from being in a polyamorous relationship. So she even gives the example of one study which found that monogamous relationships were rated more positively than polyamorous ones, even on dimensions which had nothing to do with relationships. So for example, whether the people were more likely to floss or more likely to walk their dogs, um, <laughs> which is quite surprising. Yeah, she mentions that it creates this halo effect. Mm. So if somebody knows somebody's in a monogamous relationship, that suddenly means they're a better person in all yeah. lots of ways. And the same thing you can see studies about people who are deemed to be very attractive are suddenly rated as being more intelligent or, mm. or are more likely to be hired or promoted and all of these things. And that tells us something about the way that the culture sees things yeah. is that if there is a certain norm that is recommended and bought into by the majority is that people who then decide to walk away from the majority to do something different is going to make people feel uncomfortable. 
then the question is, is that what does that discomfort turn into? Mm -hmm. Because that can, and we've already been touching upon this, that impacts the law when we mm -hmm. say, you're not allowed to get married to more than two people. Now, we're not going to be getting into a big discussion about polygamy as a necessary a preference or, or a dispreference to getting married because that's not really the point. We're just focusing on the love going on at the moment. Yeah. But that's something worth mentioning. Another really similar point to the issues of polyamory is also heteronormativity as well. Mm. Because she talks at length about certain aspects of when people define love as being actually love. So she says there is a history, particularly within religious circles of saying that homosexuality is not actually love. It is perhaps just lust or some sort of form of sin and that we cannot associate these things as being a type of love because it doesn't fit our model. Mm. And then that, again, might impact whether or not somebody can get married as well and all the institutions that are associated with being in love. If you're not religious, it still might come through as people saying, oh, well, that's not love, that's just sex. That's two people engaging in a sexual activity, but they can't really be in love. There is a difference between these two things. And that's something that uh, she has experienced people talking about. She also brings up the issue of being told that being part of a polyamorous relationship is an, quote, experiment, uh, mm. where she replies and says, well, isn't every relationship an experiment? <laughs> um, just because this one might not be common for you does not mean that it is any less of an experiment than what you're doing. Mm. It's just not what you are familiar with. So there are all of these subtle or not so subtle ways of saying, this is just not normal. And yeah. so you should not do that. And on top of that, then she also suggests that this makes somebody who doesn't go with the norm as being, quote, a rebel. Mm. And that comes with connotations. With that in mind, then, you can imagine how language becomes really important in this discussion. Imagine if the way that you loved, the only words that you could reach to, if you were, particularly if you were growing up, were all negative. Mm -hmm. So if you were a gay person living in a society where it was just a sin, it was seen as being sort of immoral or mm. even disgusting, and those are the only terms that were ever talked about, then that would create shame and discomfort and all of the things that go with that as well. So she says then that the language here matters. That creates a sense that like, you actually feel like you belong in your own skin and that you deserve to be loved by other people. Yeah, and just to add on to the language, I think also that the stories matter of what is out there. So if you hear stories of successful relationships and it gives you that as an option, but otherwise you only see the one train line of what the relationship is meant to be like. This is an odd one. I wanted to hear what you had to think about this of different types of living situations that might be limited because of the way that people conceptualize what love is. Mm. So for instance, can you think of any reasons for why the society that you currently live in would have an issue of two people of the same sex living together long term? And they're not romantically involved. Do you think that they would have social pressure that would make them not want to do that or would make them feel uncomfortable about that choice that they would might want to make? I can't say from experience, but I was just saying to Jack actually earlier that I heard about a website where single mothers can find other single mothers who might want to cohabitate. Oh, it's and Facebook. <laughs> it's not Facebook. No. <laughs> Um, that maybe like these sort of possibilities are becoming more common and I don't know whether they do still face criticism nonetheless. I mean, I would, I would say like in an ideal world, of course not. I mean, that'd be silly. Like if there's two people that want to share a living situation that are close friends, but it's not a ro quote unquote like romantic relationship. Mm. I mean, I would say there shouldn't be a problem with that. But the question was, do I think those people will feel pressure? Absolutely. I mean, not even, I think, just from like strangers in society, in social situations, but you know, potentially from family members or from mm. other friends or even, you know, if they have children or, you know, that sort of thing. There would be a pressure to do that. I mean, even myself, I was raised by a single parent family. And even when I was very, very young, I was really hyper aware that my mother was not married. And that the other people that I knew's parents were, mm. um, or it felt like they all were. I mean, they didn't end up staying that way because divorce is really common. 
But it felt like that when I was a kid. And I, yeah. and I definitely feel like my mother definitely felt a lot of that kind of pressure when she was raising me on her own, that she needed a man to help her raise me, that she couldn't raise me on her own. And I definitely, 100% of that pressure would be there, I think, yeah. So my hunch, and of course, I, this is just a hunch because I don't have any data to back this up. But my suspicion is that two things that would occur. Mm. One, if let's say if you take, so two women or two men that wanted to live together, they are just simply friends. One, I think that there might be at least some chat early on about like, oh, well, are they actually romantically involved? Like there would be an assumption that yeah. romance was actually there, but they didn't want to talk about it or admit it. And that is part of this ambassadormativity stuff. It's this sense that the whole point is to find somebody that you romantically love and yeah. to live with them. Mm. So if you're going to do that, long term. And I don't mean like a house share at uni or like until you both find the people you are actually going to be romantically mm -hmm. involved with. I'm talking about people who would live with each other by choice for 20 years or something, mm -hmm. but they're just friends. So one, I yeah. think there would be an assumption of romantic feelings there. So I think that might be telling. But I also think that people would be put off doing that. I can only speak for myself, but I don't think that living situation was ever once suggested as a legitimate form of living mm. while I was growing up. Oh, yeah. Nobody I knew did that. Nobody I know right now is doing <laughs> that. And isn't that just kind of weird? That very rarely, and I know there must be exceptions to the rule, but the idea that there are so many people, I know that lots of people like to live on their own. But mm. There might be a lot of people who live on their own who would actually quite like to live with friends, but the stigma would be something off-putting. So yeah. they just don't. That's really weird. And I think that's like a side effect of this. Mm. I think a big part of it, especially for us in the West and in historically Christian countries or Abrahamic countries or the Abrahamic religions in particular, is that it's seen as part of the natural order and God's will to have this reproductive society where you have a responsibility to have children and you have to do that in a heteronormative relationship. And maybe we've still got the overshadowing or the final effects of that running through society. And obviously that is changing quite significantly, especially over the last 100, 200 years. But we shouldn't be too surprised to see it given the strength of that influence on our culture. Now, one of the strongest influences on our culture is that the goal of our lives should be something like happiness or pleasure. Do what makes you happy. Is that relationship making you happy? Well, that's the question you've got to ask yourself. Well, can you see yourself being happy with that person or those people? And that's the question which we're constantly asked. Is it conducive of our individual happiness? Now, one of the things that Carrie Jenkins wants to do in the book is, it's actually quite a radical thing, right? She's doing the philosophy of love, but then she wants to completely turn on its head our value system and say, actually, we shouldn't be aspiring towards happiness. We should be aspiring towards something else. Before we introduce that idea, though, she thinks that there's a problem with going for happiness, and that's what people call the paradox of happiness. Yeah, so this is actually from her second book on love, Sad Love. And she opens up the book with a whole discussion on what she calls the paradox of happiness, but that's not, I mean, she didn't coin that term, but it's one that she uses and refers to again and again in the book. And she cites a number of scholars that have all said very similar things on this point. So she talks about John Stuart Mill, who had himself experienced a mental breakdown early in his life, where he was then led to make the suggestion that when one pursues happiness, mm. is that that very pursuit makes you unhappy. That hence the paradox. So when we're going after the thing we want and we make this the aim of our lives is that it has the adverse effect. Mm. She also talks about Viktor Frankl as well, who makes a very similar point and makes a, a strong suggestion that rather than happiness, we should be pursuing some form of meaning, which might as a byproduct create happiness. But the, the pursuit of happiness itself is actually a misguided principle. Mm. She gives those examples of flow activities, doesn't she? And says, if you want to actually achieve this happiness, what you'll find is those activities that take a lot of physical or mental energy to get going, like recording a podcast, going for a run or working on a piece of art, there's creative outlets that you have. We all, we all have them in some way or another. And in the middle of those experiences, you realize you're not thinking about anything else and you're in this tranquil state of what you might consider to be happiness. But if you were to aim on just getting that happiness, then it's self-defeating. Yeah, and I think she raises another point within this, which is sort of the dark side of the pursuit of happiness. Our culture, of what some people call toxic positivity, where the message is you are completely responsible for your own happiness. So you've been told to do flow activities, to meditate 10 minutes every day. And 
if someone's not happy, you sort of put it on them. But actually, this individual might not be happy because of their circumstances, perhaps because of poverty or anything else like that. But it's being overlooked because we're saying, oh, you should be happy. It's in your hands. You can do it. Yeah, she deeply criticizes this idea that happiness and love are free as well. That actually there are economic realities here worth considering that if one has a higher income, they might be able to hire other people to do a lot of the manual labor stuff that might get in the way of those flow activities. And so in which case then, while technically speaking, flow activities are often free, having the time to pursue those activities is certainly not free. So she looks at a more holistic approach to how one might go about finding these states and the current model, as it were, comes up wanting. Yeah, I think I just want to weave in something here from Bell Hooks, which was a big influence on Carrie Jenkins and her work, which is Bell Hooks also mentions something connected to the paradox of happiness with the idea that she says that people often attach happiness to the wrong things as well, especially within a capitalist system. Mm. There's definitely this focus on like specifically material gain and that people will go over and beyond to potentially harm people or lie intentionally or unintentionally to get what they think makes them happy yeah. and that obviously this is not what we want and if we're especially if we're looking at the context of romantic love you know the idea that you would potentially emotionally or physically harm your partner because you want some stuff or to maintain a particular lifestyle is something that bell hooks is really critical of and i think that that's a really nice way of looking at it as well so we, we kind mm. of don't always know what makes us happy and that's really dangerous if the wrong people are not thinking about it So let's bring this back into romance then, because it's quite evident that a lot of the promise of romance involves happiness. Yeah. That you want, as Jack said that, like you want to be with somebody who makes you happy. We get married potentially because we think that that will be very fulfilling and create more happiness. By having children, this will bring joy to our lives. Mm. And all of these things might be true, but they also might not always be true either. Mm. So that matters. And the promise then of romantic love is that happily ever after. Yeah. But that's what we want. And if a relationship is stuttering or that there is perhaps sometimes anger and frustration, that means that it's simply just not going to work out mm. and that we should find somebody else that makes us happy. Of course, again, we are saying this a lot, but like, yes, sometimes it is definitely good to get out of a relationship that is unfulfilling or makes you unhappy. But that mm. does not technically mean that one, you aren't in love or that actually those things aren't always bad to a relationship given certain contexts. What's part of the problem here as well is, so in the same way the chase for happiness is doomed for failing, and love is sort of paralleling this, is our conception of love as being a feeling. So I think that's very prominent with our society is that love is sort of just feeling good, just really an emotion, and that's very widespread. So even within psychologists often put love in the category of what psychology investigates as emotions, as positive emotions. So as with happiness, when love is reduced to this feeling, it really loses its connections to things that are maybe bigger and more important to the individual. So if we are pursuing the happily ever after, another problem is that it's also an image of static love. So it's like you're reaching this end point, but actually a healthy relationship is something which is dynamic and that grows and changes over time. She brings in an interesting study here as well which is that having this dream of happy ever after can actually Mm. harm our chances of finding and being in a good romantic relationship. So she gives the example of a study where individuals were primed to either think of love as sort of a perfect unity of two halves, Mm. or they were primed to think of love as a journey with up and downs. And then the participants were asked to imagine relationship conflicts. And the ones who were thinking about love as being perfect unity had much more impact of this negative conflict and made them have a worse vision of their relationship. If you're looking for an excellent philosophy podcast, here is the show for you. The Partially Examined Life is a philosophical podcast by four guys who were once set at doing philosophy for a living and then thought better of it. For each episode, they pick a text and chat about it with some balance between insight and flippancy. You don't have to know any philosophy or even have read the text they're discussing to follow and enjoy. With a 13-year-plus catalogue of episodes, The Partially Examined Life has probably covered any philosophical topic you're interested in, from practical ethics to the theoretical foundations of science. They go deep into the history of philosophy while making it personal and funny. Join the over 45 million downloads already pondering with The Partially Examined Life. Find new episodes wherever you stream your podcast or at partiallyexaminedlife.com. Right, let's jump back into it. 
It's like she's never heard of manifesting. <laughs> if you yeah. think you're going to get the relationship, <laughs> you're going to get it. Yeah. Well, she does. She does literally mention that. Idea, doesn't <laughs> she? Um, so let's bring this back. So if we said that there's the happiness paradox, then yeah. she says that there is the romantic paradox as well. And she says the romantic paradox is simply this: chasing romantic quote, happily ever after tends to make us unhappy. It is a special case of the paradox of happiness that you get by restricting attention to a particular kind of happiness, mainly the kind alluded to in the romantically happy ever after. Mm. We could phrase a version of the romantic paradox by analogy with Mill's version of the paradox of happiness, quote, those only after happy ever after who have their minds fixed on some object other than their own happiness ever after. So it's that weird thing of like, we will find happiness in love if we create relationships where the purpose is not to be happy in love. Mm. A good way to think about that is don't go shopping when you're hungry. Mm. Right? So the idea is... Is that a euphemism for dating? (laughs) (laughs) if 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 you are seeking like a certain kind of love and craving it and want it, yeah, I mean, to Jenkins' argument, that it will be ultimately unsatisfying, right? Whereas, I mean, I'm not saying she's saying just sit at home and do nothing and if nobody shows up, you know, but I think that is a nice way of thinking about it, right? That if you're constantly striving for this ideal, um, Mm. which we've talked about being like, you know, socially constructed and massively impacted by lots of different things, then it's going to be almost a little bit dehumanizing. I mean, you know, the idea we'll talk a little bit in a moment about intimacy with a person and how she explains like you know understanding a person and taking them for who they are you know if you're striving for this ideal and that person doesn't meet that ideal as well then that could cause rejection that could cause other problems and unhappiness right or you know not these romantic feelings so yeah i quite like that way of thinking about it don't go shopping when you're hungry i think that sums it up quite nicely yeah and thinking of these ideals as well brings it back to like the toxic side of positivity as well so like if someone is unhappy in the relationship, they'll be seen as failing it. Or if they're not in one, they might also be seen as failing it. And again, having this attitude sort of puts under the cover all the actual problems. So perhaps someone's not in a relationship because they're in a society, their family isn't letting them pursue the relationship that they want. And it's again, all putting it on the person rather than the society. So instead of going for happiness as the goal of our romantic relationships. Carrie Jenkins thinks that we should be aspiring towards eudaimonic love. Eudaimonic love in the sense that it doesn't matter if ultimately whether we're happy or not. She's not translating eudaimonia as happiness, but in terms of human flourishing, the flourishing of ourselves as people, our relationship as an entity in itself, and our contribution to the wider world. And it's up to us how we want to craft that flourishing. The issue with that is, is that while she is, of course, interested in flourishing, she still wants to use eudaimonia in a slightly different way as well, because she, in the book, she gives a section on the etymology of the word. She talks about daimones as being like spirits that have an impact, which I know, Jack, you're thrilled with that <laughs> image. Uh, and, the, the, um, and so when she talks about like good daimones, what she's meaning is like good spirits in mm. a very metaphorical sense mm. of the word. She doesn't yep. say that you have to believe that there are good spirits looking over you, guiding you in love and life. What she is saying is, is that there are forces at play that dictate how likely you are to be successful in your relationships. Mm. Then we can start bringing in all the things that we were talking about in some of the problems with the social script that we might be given. So how successful are you likely to be if all the daimones, quote, all of the things that might be material economic realities, mm. all of the things that society say, What if like no films or no books ever from the perspective of your romantic interests kind of thing? All these things might make your love illegitimate. Mm. And so if somebody, let's say, wants to be polyamorous and wants to start being in long-term relationships with more than one person, they might find that their parents and their friends say things like, oh, well, isn't that quite the experiment? Or or, that's not really love. Mm. Or that won't ever work out because somebody's bound to get jealous. And what about all of these other problems that go with it? Have you thought about these? All of those things matter. And she actually says that people will be more successful in their relationships if they feel that those relationships are respected by others. The social aspect of this matters so much to us that even if you think you're going to be able to have a successful romantic relationship that breaks the norm, sometimes that doesn't work out because of these daimones. Mm. And so she's saying that this is a collective process, really. That it's not just about the individuals. Rose has already mentioned this, is that, yeah, okay, in some sense, you can take ownership of your own happiness and you can do certain things. 
you could meditate, you could eat right, do exercise, all of that stuff. And there's also another sense that you can't always be in control of your happiness because loads of things might get in the way of being able to do those things. Mm -hmm. Likewise, by analogy, there might, in some sense, you could take control of your own romantic love, but society might have very different ideas about that. Yeah. And that might prevent you from actually living that and feeling fulfilled and flourish. Mm. Yeah, and she doesn't just say that for polyamorous couples, she says it for monogamous couples as well, right? That love isn't a happily ever after. Human beings sometimes suffer due to their love, and that's okay. So for her idea of eudaimonic love, seeing love more as a collaborative work of art, she mentions in the book. So removing feelings of happiness from the center of love, because those emotions can be quite unstable. So You know, take this kind of diamond example. I think grief is a really good one we could think of. This is something completely out of control. Let's say you've got a monogamous relationship between two people and one of their parents passes away. That is going to cause immense amounts of sadness and suffering on the individual person and the relationship. Like Mm. it will have an impact. It's a diamond. It's out of control. And Carrie Jenkins is saying that that doesn't mean that the relationship is falling apart or that this loving relationship is kind of, you know, doesn't work. Mm. That part of what love is, is kind of dealing with those feelings, right? Marriage can sometimes be really hard work, be it monogamous or polyamorous or or whatever. That She uses this really nice analogy in the book of kind of job crafting, right? Or like love crafting, she calls it, um, where the idea is that you create your own role within the relationship, that the two of you together kind of build towards like a collaborative project. And that looking at a relationship that way will mean that you will have a a longer lasting intimacy than just we're together because we make each other happy. I know the grief example is quite a serious one, but even if it's like something little, like, you know, just domestic annoyances, maybe somebody doesn't put the toilet seat down or doesn't take out the rubbish, right? Like relationships have suffering and she's saying that's okay. If we change the perspective from just happiness to a collaborative project, Mm -hmm. it means that people will have more success and more meaning in their relationships. There is a nice analogy between her view and Aristotle's view, or the ancient view before Aristotle of diamonds and you diamond here. She distances herself from it slightly, but remember for Aristotle too, to flourish, you needed wealth, you needed health, you needed good friends and family. And similarly here, she's saying that you need a tolerant society which doesn't enforce the social script on people who don't want to fall into that social script. And so... She cites a lot of data in there about how people in long-term marriages actually would prefer to be having sex outside of that marriage or perhaps not stay in a relationship for the sake of it just because that's what the society tells them to do. So you're right, she uses that idea of crafting what we want the actor of love to play in terms of our preferences, in terms of what we want from our life to flourish. But there is that sense there which... I don't want to get into the further analysis because we're we're on the verge of getting to part four anyway, but she is uncomfortable with the idea then of of us picking somebody because of particular attributes that make us happy. In quote, the idea of one person having more or less value than others makes me uncomfortable. If a partner has value, even if it's infinite, that means they can be compared in terms of others. But it raises this interesting question about if it's not about us being happy and picking somebody for certain attributes about them, which is conducive from happiness. How do I pick one person over the other person? How do I know if happiness isn't the goal to leave a relationship, if the relationship is allowed to have such sadness and and sorrow? Yeah, I'm I'm glad you mentioned that because I did find that particularly an odd way of phrasing it when I was reading it as well, which is that there is, in some moral sense, it might matter to say that everybody ought to be respected with a certain type of dignity. And then that way, everybody is, quote, as lovable not unconditionally, because let's say somebody does something really horrible to make it almost impossible to respect them, putting that aside. But when we are in a friendship or in a romantic relationship with somebody, we like them because of the things that they do and who Mm. they are, and Mm. they do matter more to us. That is surely quite a defining important part of a relationship. Mm. I like my friends because of who they are and not just they could be replaced by any other person I find off the Mm. street who happens to have similar interest to them. Hang on, is she saying that about friends though or is she just being specific well, with romantic partners? that's how the book partners? ends, right? She says, I don't see there to be a radical difference between friendship and romantic love. In fact, sex and those feelings of that thrill of falling in love are extra add-ons. That's how the book ends, right? That there isn't yeah, a, really yeah. a difference. Yeah, well, yeah, or it is for every couple or multiple. So whether it's three or four people in a polyamorous relationship, it's up for them to define the basis of what their loving relationship involves. 
And that might mean that it started off as a slow burn friendship mm -hmm. that developed into love. And that's okay. We can call that love. It doesn't have to have that love at first sight, all of yeah. the dopamine, oxytocin stuff that we were talking about earlier, at least in the same strength that we might have been describing it. And so I think she has to say that it's entirely defined upon what you yeah, want it to be. Exactly. And I think that's why we're being pushed towards some kind of analysis towards the end here, because she leaves it open. I think she sees that as a virtue of her view to be like, you can freely choose existentially how you want those relationships to be. But that raises an interesting question, doesn't it? As to whether us four now sat in this room together can say, well, I define this as romantic love. This is what I want romantic love to be. And that runs in tension to what perhaps we were experiencing or associate with those concepts beforehand. Yeah. So to round up the concept of eudaimonic love, as she says, quote, is about actively crafting our relationships to best suit the circumstances and the people involved. And through these relationships, making meaning rather than passively waiting for happiness to arrive with one's prince. So it's really taking into account the circumstances and how we can modify and have freedom to choose within these circumstances what suits us best and what aligns with our values. And to me, that I think sounds like a good and open way to be talking about how people should be able to live their lives. Their choice could be very fulfilling, depending whether it fits the script or not. Yeah, my only hang up was that kind of definition of the person that you love. Yeah. And that might just be a misunderstanding on my part or just a philosophical hang up. But I find it odd that you would describe the person that you're with as almost being like everybody else, which I know <laughs> technically speaking is true, but also not <laughs> true at the same time. I don't think it's a misunderstanding. I think we'll get into this more in the further analysis because in Sky Cleary's review of the books we read from Carrie Jenkins, she says, and I quote, sexual desire and the dopamine rush that Helen Fisher attributes to romantic love are optional add-ons in Jenkins's theory. All we need is oxytocin, the chemical that seems to fuel affection and, and attachment. But since attachment and affection describe all kinds of love, it's unclear what makes love romantic in Jenkins's dual theory. And I think Jenkins embraces that at the end of both books. She says, if you want that to be romantic love, then that's what romantic love can be to you. Whether or not that's the right or wrong way to think about love for now shall remain. A, a mystery. Yeah, a mystery. <laughs> the mystery philosopher. Okay, our final mystery philosopher. Andrew, you got Taylor Swift, didn't you? Did you get, and Rose, you got oh, Elvis, Elvis Presley. Yeah, now you look, you know I'm looking at, don't even the listener knows I'm looking at with disappointment <laughs> eyes. Oh. Love can involve <laughs> failure and disappointment, Jack, oh. and he can still be loved. But he's not he? flourishing either. Wow. <laughs> that's, not that's on your also, definition of flourishing. Yeah, that's My true. diamonds are fine, thank you. <laughs> if I say I'm flourishing, then I'm flourishing. Here's your quote from your pop star mystery philosopher. I would give up forever to touch you, because I know that you feel me somehow. You're the closest to heaven that I'll ever be, and I don't want to go home right now. That's uh, Goo Goo Dolls, and the song is... The song is... Uh, it is the Goo Goo Dolls. Yeah. Um, 1998. Yeah. And it was the soundtrack to which popular film as well? Yeah, City of... Angels featuring Nicolas Cage and Meg. Ryan. Nice. Very good. But the name of the song is... <laughs> I can't remember. Nice. It got a really obvious... Begins with an I, ends in an S. Oh, Iris? That's the one. <laughs> 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 well, that was good fun. We'll see you next time for further analysis and discussion, where we'll finally be talking about some existentialism as well as our thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> on Carrie Jenkins's <laughs> work. If you want to get that right here and now, then you can go to patreon.com forward slash pansycast to get early access. Otherwise, we'll see you in a couple of weeks' time. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Pan Psychast. The next installment of this episode will be available a week on Sunday. Patreon subscribers already have access to the next installment of the show. To support the podcast and get yourself heaps of extra perks, head over to www.patreon.com forward slash pan or hit the link in the iTunes description. To find out more about the show and get all of our old episodes completely free, you can
you can visit thepansycast.com. From all of us here at the Pansycast, thank you for your support and thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. It's been lots of fun. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening. Thank you all. I've enjoyed it a lot. Thanks a lot. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. I really appreciate what you folks are trying to do. That was great. That was really good. You guys really read up on this. That was good. Wow. (laughs) That was a lot of fun. You guys uh, managed to combine the banter and the philosophy perfectly, I think. Beautiful. Fantastic. Oh, well done, you guys. Gosh, you're doing a wonderful thing with this. (laughs)